growing up. Food is growing up. And so how um, can we operationally change our model in order to, to cover what's happening? And um, you know what that means is from a, for us, we're in the middle of refinancing a lot of our uh, communities and, and capital. And so that's very difficult to do right now. And you really have to show um, continuous improvement from an occupancy perspective. You have to continuously show um, improvement from a net operating income perspective for a consistent period of time in order to kind of get over the hump um, of getting all of, your, all of your debt refinanced. So essentially uh, for us, you know, you may hear us talk about debt covenants. Are we meeting our debt covenants? Um, most of which right now is at a one four five coverage ratio. So if your mortgage is $100, you actually have to make $145 in order to keep that mortgage in place. Even if you're paying it every single month, even if you never miss a payment. Um, so some of that is a challenge for us on the capital market side as we're really trying to enforce uh, operations and, and push cash flows in that perspective. That's helpful. So, Joe, can you tell us from the development side, we've had a lot of partners yeah. actively seeking development. Yeah, so I feel like we got through World War One, which was COVID, <laughs> and now we're in World War Two, which is you know capital market hell. Let's be honest, right? Um, so we both operate and have the same challenges that Lindsay has and everyone on the stage has, um, which is twofold. Is one our debt has gone up, right? And many of our buildings almost doubled in, case, in some cases. So if your NO, and to equate this into our buildings, if your NOI was $100,000 a month, you may now need to make overnight, because interest rates have gone up, $160,000 overnight just to pay the mortgage. And so that's why you're seeing this huge pressure from your regional director, or from your owner, or from the lender, whoever you're working with within your organization, um, to, we've got to fill this building, we've got to fill this building, we've got to push rates, collect those community fees, all of those things. Uh, from a development standpoint, you know, it's been super challenging. Um, as you all know, that inflation throughout COVID has significantly driven up costs, particularly development costs, whether it's wood, concrete, steel, um, it's that they're all at all-time high numbers. And so even with normal interest rates, the development side, the cost structure is, is very challenging. And then on top of that, you add these high interest rates and it's almost impossible to do developments right now today. Um, I know Doris also develops and we've been really fortunate to have really strong, good capital partners behind us that see that vision that while many people are really challenged because they don't have good capital today, um, and they can't get new projects off the ground because of the cost. We have capital that is able to get projects up off the ground right now, carry some extra cost, but in three or four years when these projects are open, there's gonna be no new other projects on the market. And so in our current buildings, and everyone's buildings that are in here at that point, I'm sure will be 90 plus percent occupied. Um, and we'll, we'll be looking for new product. The consumer will be looking for new product in three or four years. And so um, while it's a tale of, you know, of a beat up right now, I feel like the, the people that are working really hard, everyone in this room that's working really hard, um, and us on the development side that is, you know, trying to align with good capital partners um, and have a good track record part of the reason we can get things financed is because of our track record, because of executive directors and our assets, um, are showing positive results every month. And so we can go to our lenders and say, hey, look at the team we have. They're kicking, they're kicking ass, quite honestly. And so trust us and lend us money in a really tough environment because look at the teams that we put in place and look at the teams we're gonna to continue to put in place that will you know, make sure your asset is successful. So it's a story of, you know, it's, it's hard, but I think that people that are doing a good job today are going to be very successful from for getting to, once we get to this. We agree with you on uh, the demand equation for consumers, for sure. Yeah. So, if you tell us about the REITs, if you would. I know you worked with two of the large public REITs. Um, what kind of pressures are they putting on you? 
So I have a question for everybody that's in here. Who works at a community level or supports a community level? Perfect. How often of those who just put their hands up are you really in the weeds or understand the like dynamic between who owns what, who manages you, what capital partners? How, how, how often are you guys, just by show of hands, like pretty aware of all of those dynamics? Pretty minimal. So, so I want to explain that a little bit um, because we're talking real high level and this is why we wanted to talk to you about some stuff that we don't normally talk about. The, the real, I think, challenge when we're talking about, you know, whether it's a REIT or an equity partner or somebody that just owns it, right? There's very, very few companies out there, unlike RUI, who just 100% owns everything. But still, you guys work with Wealth Tower, work with REITs, right? So there's all these, like, weird dynamics. So for me, you know, we work with two of the largest REITs that are out there that focus a lot on senior housing. And while the pressures aren't there for us from a capital perspective, because their debt is set, they're in a very, very different position. Uh, so on my team, we have three buildings where the capital provider, they have no cash, and the, 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 the larger you know, equity source and their, their actual bank is coming down very, very hard on them. And it is a tremendous strain on those three buildings and on the teams that support them. Who, who here has some of that? Like I got some that have like no capital strain and others that have, have do have capital strain. It's kind of all over the board, right? So the REITs, because they don't, they're not always as affected by these changing tides because of the way that they access the markets are a little bit different. But it doesn't make us by any means immune to any of that because within our portfolio, like many of yours, we have all kinds of different capital partners. And so when, it, when it's coming from us to come back to you, we're all trying to keep a common theme, right? We're all trying to bring the same programs regardless of whether our buildings are in Florida or our buildings are in Alabama. We're always trying to keep those pieces together, but who your capital partner is is playing a tremendous role on some of those pressures that are coming. Like we're, we're still dealing with margins, right? We're still dealing with the, the influx of, of cost. And while our labor is stabilized to some degree, you know, we're still getting those questions from our capital partners in the REIT world in particular about how we're going to get back to those margins. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing that term too. We're gonna get back to those pre-pandemic margins. And so it's really about talking with the REITs and understanding are there longer term holds or are these shorter term holds, like as Melissa mentioned and Joe and Lindsay mentioned, you know, really trying to understand where those values play in. Because when you're talking about our buildings, you know, while we are all here to provide those day-to-day -day supports, you know, the capital that is up above, they also care about making sure that we're bringing programming, but they also have to remember that they have investors that they have to answer to, and they also have capital numbers that they have to hit as well. So you guys definitely have, without having all of that information that sometimes we have and that you clearly said you don't always understand the intricacies of, it, it does make what we're trying to deliver, depending on who those capital partners are, confusing. Well, let's be honest. I mean, how many conversations have we had about we went from a $12 per resident per day food cost to now we got to get down to nine fifty, and how are we doing that? I mean, those are decisions that, I mean, I want to spend $15 per resident per day if we can. You mean you don't? Something like that. I'm surprised. I'm really <laughs> um, surprised you don't spend but, but, I, but those are decisions that sometimes feel, don't necessarily feel good at the community level when we're saying, hey, we got to change things up. When residents are accustomed to receiving services at twelve fifty per resident per day, and the executive director is getting the directive of, well, you went from forty thousand dollars per month to now you can only spend thirty thousand dollars per month with the same amount of residents, right? I mean, I think, how do we navigate? That? I think Doris, for you, because your capital partner is really just one. I mean, how? I'm just curious. I mean, I feel like the three of us have lots of capital partners. Joe probably has the most, by you know, if we're going to really start counting here. But I think Doris has the least <laughs> yes. of, of all of us here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's um, a challenge, right? Mission versus margin. And you know, at REY, our mission is to deliver a lifestyle that our residents have earned and deserve. So how do you balance that 
with margin, especially when it's at no fault at the community level and it is the interest rates. We are very lucky at Retirement Unlimited because we actually own some of our communities outright, so we, are, we, we don't participate in any mortgages. We're kind of mortgage free, but that's because we've been around for 40 years and we kind of just took the steady, just kind of like at your home and, and paid off your mortgage. But some of our new developments, they're still in what's called a floating rate. And of course, we're just getting, you know, um, hammered by the interest rates because what happens is a year and a half ago, uh, that interest would be, let's just say, $20,000. And at no fault to anybody, now it's $80,000. And so, you know, there's no magic money, right? And so we try at REY to make sure that we hold the executive directors accountable at the NOI because that has nothing. There's no fault of them. There's no fault of us. However, there's no magic money, right? So we have to pay the bills. I mean, part of the bills is paying the mortgage and the interest rate. And so it's a balance, and, and we try to find ourselves in that balance of mission versus margin is how do we make the buildings more efficient? Um, and, you know, I mean, we, we've got the awesome team, right? The dream team over here, they make, the, you know, they make everything happen. But, you know, how can we help that? And so part of it, I think, is our responsibility is we've been looking at vendors. Um, consolidating vendors, um, where can we have partnerships with some of the vendors, where we can make some decisions that can help the bottom line without any of our executive directors having to make a different operational decision. Um, and you know, of course, so I think that we have that balance and, and that's what's been challenging. And so hopefully when people are asking for more, I hope that the executive directors at the community level know that it's not people being greedy looking for more, it's just trying to make up that gap right now um, that you know the economy has has um, presented to us on top of like Joe just said on top of our food costs going up our labor going up and so there's that balance that we're always trying to you know finagle. Well that magic money I love that and as a banker I can tell you there was magic money in 2019. <laughs> no longer magic money all that magic money is vaporizing. Um, but what what sort of situations has that created for you all you know in terms of picking up management contracts in terms of acquisitions, you know, how, how has this disruption created opportunity that may not have anything to do with the property before? I'll jump in here for a second. Um, I, I think what we're starting to see, right, where you have a lot of, let's just say a lot of lenders that are typically very focused and preoccupied with transactions, right, the buy and sell, buy and sell, what's the price? Um, they are now internally pulling back, right? Because no one's really lending right now, um, and no one's buying and no one's selling. And so a lot of the, the assets and the REITs, they're pulling in and basically they are just now managing their assets that they have and trying to maximize their portfolio. And so what we're also seeing is a time where there's these added pressures, but now the focus from capital, they have the time to focus where previously they're preoccupied with all these other things. <clears throat> the the well, regulators gave us kind of choice, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> it's, it's daggers, by the way. And so, um, so there's this additional added pressure, right, and additional added focus. And so, and right now, capital is, and owners are having to tell stories of, hey, you know what, while we're not meeting our mortgage payments or, you know, we can't meet our debt payments, um, you know, basically the answer is go change operator and let's see if SEBI or RUI or Validus can do a better job than Distinctive can do um, and vice versa. And so there's a lot of moving around of management companies right now um, from a REIT perspective, from a capital perspective, um, and they may be going from a, big, you know, a bigger operator you know, to a smaller regional operator where they think they're going to get more focus. <coughs> Um, so there's a lot of movement around, particularly in the operating world, um, which also comes with added pressures. Um, and I think the pressures, I think this is a really, really important topic for all of you that work at the building level. Because I think that immediately when there is a change of operator, the management company is changing, that you're immediately looked at like, I'm going to lose my job. You know, especially in those three key positions that like there's something specifically that you were doing wrong. Now, I'm not saying there are not situations where some of your key players are impeding your ability to be successful, but there are many, many times when we walk in, the mass majority of the time, it is a 90-day window for us to reevaluate the current team that's on location. 
We're never ever going in there. I can. I feel very confident to speak this for all, everybody sitting up here. We're never going in there immediately coming in to slash your job and, and, and crush your team that you probably spent a lot of time keeping or trying to identify over the last 18 months. So we're really just kind of coming in there to say what was working, what wasn't working, and how can we do better? Because just like there's no magic money, there's no magic operator out there either, right? I mean, show of hands, anybody know a magic answer to anything? No, nope, nobody got that answer either. But if you do, come find me afterwards. But um, nobody is coming in and expecting you to suddenly, you know, slash your expenses that you weren't able to do the last, you know, 10 months, right? And we're also, we're just there to try to sit down and say, what's been working, what isn't working? How can we lend more assistance or support? And how can we move forward together to get this done? Because sometimes, and you're gonna see this a lot like Joe indicated, there is a huge movement from the big, huge companies to some of these, like what I would consider to be more nimble, regional, smaller, or more boutique companies that can be a little bit more focused, right? Nobody's, we're trying to not be cookie cutter anymore. I think there's a big, big movement away from being cookie cutter. And my advice to all of you that are out there, when you have an idea and you see that something might work that's not being done, bring it up. Talk to your regional people. Make sure that you're, that you're putting it together. Because if you have a good idea, trust me when I tell you, all of us at the table are here to listen and apply. Now be careful because if you bring it up, you might be the one that's also going to be leading the charge on it. <laughs> but, but do that. Like we, Now is the time as an industry that we have to start thinking outside of the box. We cannot keep doing the same things and continuing to think we're going to get different results. And that's all any of us are going to be doing if you see one of us suddenly secret shopping your building. We're really just there to try to look and say, and collaborate, we're all collaborating together. All of us talk, I mean, we're all very, very good friends up here. And we're friends with many, many other of some of your, your, your owners and people that you work with, because we're all at the end of the day just trying to do the right thing for our industry. And when we do the right thing for our industry, everybody will win. But we no way, shape, or form expect any of us to like magically walk in with magic money that's gonna solve every problem. But Seth, can I just say one one comment to something that you, you talked about earlier? It's that transition period when you walk in and everyone is, you know, you got the top three people and you got eight department heads in the building. Um, I will say this, I will challenge everyone in this room, if you're an executive director or you're a regional director, is put a red line in the PL of where you started in your community and look today where that community or that asset or your portfolio is because while there is no magic answer um i will tell you this i know in our organization doris and everyone up here i believe feels the same way um, every building regardless of the size of it if you're running a 30-bed memory credit it's a multi-million dollar business and i know in our company we do expect our executive directors to be the ceo of their buildings and we do expect them to have month over month growth and quarter over quarter growth. And so while you know we may have a management company up here, the magic in our business absolutely happens at the building level. 100%. And so while, you know, I will say this, do not use your management company or do not use your ownership as an excuse of why you are not moving the performance of your asset, because that is when change does happen. And you know we may come in and say, yeah, we're, you know we're going to evaluate everyone for ninety days. But the reality is, if your P and L is telling a very different story of the things that you can control, like your occupancy and your expenses in your building, um, that's a very different story. You know, we need people in our buildings that are going to perform. We need people in our buildings that are going to take care of our residents. Um, and quite honestly, we have very big obligations as CEOs sitting up here to make sure that the people that entrust their loved ones to us are appropriately taken care of and the people that, you know, we employ to take care of them, we can live up to those obligations, provide benefits and increases and trainings and all those things. So moral of the story, we need people to perform. Well, and as, as CEOs, your words are often quoted. I, I stole a few of your favorite quotes from each of you. And uh, one, Doris Ellie, one of the things that I've heard you say before and would love to follow on to Joe's point is uh, this is a multi-million dollar business. Why are we sometimes running it like a yogurt stand? <laughs> this table's laughing. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I wanted to say with Sevi, um, because we are a 40-year-old company, it was just uh, three years ago that we entered into the capital markets. We were traditional. You know, we build a building, go get a mortgage from a bank, and pay it off in 30 years. And, and so I hope everybody understands because we've seen that a lot. And, and I have Lisa and, and Michelle here from our first kind of transaction where we acquired a building. And the first thing Lisa asked me when I walked in the building is, am I going to lose my job? And I was like, I, we haven't even talked about that. And, you know, why would you say that? And she's been with us. They've both been with us for two years and both have been promoted. And so um, I think that... When we're going into the communities, we're looking for um, information so that we can solve it. And sometimes occupancy may not be the executive director's fault if you are if you don't have capital infusion. Uh, one of the good things about changing operators is it may come with capital infusion, and I think that that's what we've been able to provide. But as far as, you know, running a multi-million dollar business and not running it like a yogurt stand, sometimes I hear uh, team members, you know, not take like a food expense, for example, um, and just say, well, I'm not quite sure what my food is. And, and so if you're not sure what your food is, then how, how are we managing all the other stuff there? And so I think it's just being responsible, following your systems and being disciplined to follow your systems is, is more where I'm at. And I've been saying that for a, lo a lot of years as my team can convey for some reason. <laughs> you need to find a new quote. I love it. <laughs> Lindsay, one of the things I've heard you say, is the truth is always somewhere in the middle. That's true with my teenager, for sure. <laughs> but tell me how that relates to um, motivating people and, and finding facts in the situation. Yeah, I think, I mean, as you guys all know, um, running communities on a day-to-day -day basis, you're, you're, you're constantly hearing information come at you from all different aspects, right? And so, um, sometimes people tell you what they want you to hear. You know, when we walk into buildings, it's amazing the amount of stuff that come to us either from a frontline perspective, an executive director perspective, your management perspective. And you as EDs may have never even heard this person give this feedback. And suddenly they're now providing it to the CEO when they walk into the building. And so what I have learned over the years is there's always two sides to every story. Um, your people are communicating what they want to communicate, so I'd encourage you to um, try to find the truth in the middle. Try to get try to get on the information you can. Understand why somebody <coughs> might be telling you something. Um, you know, I, I'll just give an interesting example. We had one of our communities had lights out in the courtyard, and I toured the building, and one of the caregivers told me that. She didn't feel safe at night because the lights were out in the courtyard, and I thought, well, that's interesting. And so I asked our uh, maintenance director, who was unaware that the lights were out, and just kind of that fueled the whole thing of, of uh, decision making, which the next day the lights were out. But you know, it's, you wonder sometimes why you're not getting all the information you may need to actually appropriately run your building as an executive director. I know that can be frustrating when your regional team comes in and says, you know, why didn't you fix this? Well, I may not have even known about it. So really empowering your teams to be transparent in communication with you. If they feel comfortable to walk up to the CEO and tell them something when they're touring their building, they should absolutely feel comfortable to walk up to you as the executive director to tell you that they need to do something about it. And Joe, to that end, I've heard you say so many times, we can't fix what we don't know. Um, you know, it is hard to deliver bad news and not be perceived as a naysayer. So how, you know, how would you encourage your teams to communicate with you? you know? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. I think, I agree, I think sometimes the title gets in the way and puts up a barrier um, for us to be able to gather information at all levels in our organization. Um, and so for us, we've gone, um, we've done several things in our company um, to try to take some of those barriers down. Um, we have moved to a texting platform of communication with our employees called Go Happy. Um, and it's, it's amazing, right? So new employee gets started, it's directly connected to our payroll system, and every new employee gets uh, a video from George, who's our chief operating officer, saying welcome to the company. Um, and then from there, there are intervals of messages that go out to all of our employees that is, you know, at the three-day mark, at the 10-day mark, at the 14-day mark, at the 30-day mark, at the 60-day mark. 
and really just getting um, text comments back from employees at all levels, every employee in our company. And so we are actively soliciting that feedback. Um, and then of course we also do ask you know, our executive directors to hold monthly meetings with our staff. Um, so we're constantly gathering feedback and I'll tell you some of the best um, initiatives that we have rolled out in our company have come from either a maintenance technician, uh, a server in the dining room, one of our care partners, um, because you know they're living this every single day, and um, and so we want to be that open, inclusive organization um, that really listens to our employees. It's not easy. It's really not easy um, because I'll tell you, I've been you know in a building multiple times where I've heard all oh, my best employees leaving. And then I'm like, where is that employee? <laughs> and then I go talk to that employee. Guess why they're leaving? Because they didn't have a vacuum cleaner that worked. This is an employee that's been there for 15 years. They're leaving because of a vacuum cleaner that's not working? That's crazy and unacceptable. Um, and so it's really trying to break down all those barriers. Well, let's talk about your teams, uh, if we could. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll steal a quote from Herb Kelleher, CEO of, of initial founder of Southwest Airlines. Great companies don't hire skilled people and motivate them. They hire motivated people and inspire them. Sevi, how have you shifted the focus of your company to you know, really adapt to the current labor market? And so we're a family business. It's me and my brother, and my sister-in-law, and my mom, and a couple cousins. Um, I don't have any other siblings or, you know, they would, he would have worked for free too for a while. <laughs> But you know, I think we've always we've always been an employee first focus, and I think you know we don't we don't call employees or workforce we call them coworkers. That's you know associates, coworkers, team members, family members, honorary petruses, and and I believe that attitudes are caught not taught. And when you're at that top level, and each of you in this room, when you walk into your buildings every day. Whatever thing you have going on, we all know. And we're, by the way, we're not walking into our, just a building, we're walking into people's homes, correct? So whatever it is that we're bringing in there to somebody's homes is gonna be felt. And we know that the people that we're working with daily, they're there because they, they're not probably having their best day because they either, you know, they don't feel well, there's a lot of stuff going on just from a physical perspective. And I know when I'm not feeling well, for my two little kids, I'm trying to put on a good face, right? Or if I got stressful stuff going on. So I think always being mindful, as I know Joe mentioned too, like just the sheer amount of power your title brings into your, into your, into your office when your person from dietary comes in and is stressed out because their mom who normally watches their daughter couldn't get there and so they were late. You know, I think it's really about understanding the just daily things that our people that are that are getting to our buildings are going through and then making sure that you're trying to like forget your own kind of woes at the door and bring in that that attitude of we can work together, we can listen through this, we can talk through it and, and back to just really taking that minute because we all get really, really busy with our own days and we all get really tied up with that family member who just one more time called because mom was not happy with the meal again last night. And just remembering that they pay attention to your eyes shifting and they listen to the sighing and they look at the eye roll. So just remembering that our attitudes are caught, not taught. And if that's the one thing that we as a leader can do when we walk into the building or have a conversation, then I feel like we've at least accomplished that thing in trying to help inspiring versus just giving a big speech and, and doing that. I think those are important too, but just coming in with an attitude of collaboration and understanding, I think goes a really long way. And Dorselli, how much does it have to do with the age of the building? You know, the, in attracting staff and keeping residents, um, you know, I think a lot of us love the shiny new penny. I know it's easier for lenders to underwrite into situations where there's no story versus a story, you know, that hasn't gone so well. How much does that play into performance and attraction of team members? That's an excellent question for us at RUI um, because our best performing building at RUI was um, built in 1984, Paul Spring. If you look it up in Alexandria, Virginia. It's how we got our capital partner. 
Um, they couldn't understand. They built all these new shiny pennies around this building. It's an old schoolhouse. As every barrier you can think of, it's brick, it's low. But the care um, of the community, and you know, it's kind of like my mom taught me. You know, old doesn't mean dirty, like rich doesn't mean class, right? And so, I mean, the building is clean, it's well kept. The you know, the the staff is is friendly, and so it continues to outperform. We don't have a pool, we don't have any of the fancy things, um, but the building's clean, the care is great, the programming is on point, the food's fantastic, Mohammed. Um, and so um, I think that it's what's inside the building, not the, well, I think, uh, Sevi, you say it's about the care and not the chair. Mm -hmm. Got your quote in there. I know that quote from Sevi. I've been on a couple of panels with Sevi. And, um, and I, I love that, um, I love that quote. I also think that in our, I think what the pandemic taught us is that our front line is our most front facing. And so for us, we would never ask our teams to do anything that we wouldn't do. And so during the pandemic, we had to pair up and um, not had to, but we wanted to pair up. We didn't close down our office and we took weekend shifts at every one of our communities to give our leadership a break. Also because like, remember at the beginning of the pandemic, everybody was scared, right? You thought if you went in and you got COVID, like you might die. And so how could we ask our staff to come into communities if we weren't willing to go in there and, and you know work shoulder to shoulder? So I think it's that in the inside, the heartbeat of the community. And we've been able to prove that um, by the, um, well, Mel and I were just talking about our other building up in Northern Virginia that was built in 1984. And so those two buildings are two of our top uh, performing buildings um, and they were both built in the 80s. That's great. Um, I want to talk, you know, about operating margins a little bit. As a lender, I've seen you guys lease up, you know, through the lows of the pandemic, not quite to where we were pre-pandemic. I've seen you push rate, so we're going to talk about rate in a moment. But let's talk about the operating expense side of the business. I mean, you know, constantly as I anticipate, crack open those financial statements every month, see the top line revenue growing, I see insurance costs, uh, I see real estate taxes, I see a lot of these fixed components, you know, even as you stabilize labor, that continue to be pressures. How are, are each of you dealing with those? And, uh, and I guess, when will, it, when will it stop? When will it stabilize? When will we get the operating margins back that we have? because we can't just push the top line, right? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think for us, I was looking at our company-wide financial overall portfolio. <clears throat> and looking at that, um, over the past, let's just say 18 months, I think our revenue grew just under, just shy of 10% um, over an 18 month period. The problem is when you look at, you know, 47 rows below that, you look at your total expense line, and the operating expenses grew, you know, seven and a half percent. And I, I think we're at a really pivotal point. While I know our debt, we talked a lot about our debt going up. I think our expenses, for the most part, have really somewhat stabilized. That where they're going to be from a, a, a staffing perspective, right? Which is our largest expense. Our food expense is somewhat stabilized now. Um, it continues to creep up a little bit. Um, but now I think it's just really. Revenue maximization is what we're focused on in our company. Um, you know, filling apartments at an appropriate rent, um, collecting community fees, producing a very good, high quality product for our residents where they want to come in. Um, and you know, where we're seeing margin compression, we're starting to see margins now come back. Um, so, for example, in a traditional assisted living and memory care, you know, I would say 18 months ago, we were looking at probably a, I don't know, 15, 16% margin. Um, now, fast forward to today, where we're starting to see the revenue rebound um, and expenses normalize. And I say normalize, not to where they were 24 months ago, but to the new normal, right? Um, and, you know, we're running buildings that are mid to high 20s margins, sometimes in the 30s. Um, but those are buildings that have independent living with it as well. And so this is a conversation that I know all of us are having, too, with our lenders, because lenders' expectations haven't changed on margins. Yep. So they're still wanting the 33 and 34% margin that they wanted pre-COVID, right? Um, and the reality is, is you know, where we were seeing, you know, 33, 34% margins, are, we're now probably seeing 28, 29% margins. But has this shifted for good? No. I mean, I, I, mean, I think the only way that we're going to get 
closer to those is by continually incrementally increasing not just occupancy but the actual street rates that we're getting so and I think that that comes with being a little bit more focused than you know splatter so I think we have to be really strategic about saying hey I know that this room we can rent it very quickly once it comes up so we should raise that one 20% and this one that's really hard to rent, maybe we're only gonna raise that one by 5%. And I think that it's going to take probably another, sorry Melissa, 22 months to probably get closer to some of those margins that the bank's expecting. And that's because we're having to deploy capital in other places. COVID was rough on the physical plan. It really was rough. And, and we are really starting to try to not just replace a chair and replace some carpet, but there was like some real beat up buildings that I think had to kind of get put a little bit to the wayside because we had other capital that needed to go into other places. And that was with making sure that the labor market was met, taking up more cash from a just an insurance GLPL. It, you know, so now we have to put those dollars into the actual chairs and the carpets and the walls. Like those things have to get done. So I, I personally, that's my opinion. Lindsay, I don't know what you're thinking. Yeah, on I think return um, to margin. To your point, you know, it's got to be very product specific. So, you know, we have 60 units standalone memory pairs. We have 150 units assisted living memory pairs. We've got IOs. Um, and to Sebby's point about you know pushing rates of particular units, we're really going to be looking to our executive directors and our sales teams to tell us. I know I can sell this unit for five hundred dollars more, but this one I've got a discount at two hundred. Mm -hmm. And overall, looking at the big picture, because all of the markets are different, they're all performing differently. Um, I know you guys had to deal with pushing rate increases over the last twelve to twenty-four months, which we haven't pushed those rates this far ever in the industry. And I think what we're also seeing is, you know, we're all pushing in place rates hard because we have to get revenue up to cover, to get our margins back. But we have to keep pushing street rates, otherwise we've got people living in our buildings that are paying $1,500, $2,000 more than somebody coming off the street. And what happens is, Somebody that might be living in my building is now going and shopping their three buildings because they might be able to move that at a lower price. So we all really have to be um, transparently talking in our markets as to what's going on. And I actually challenge some of our executive directors and sales teams to go be friends with your competitors. Know what they're doing. Know your position in the market. We're talking. We all have buildings in competitive markets. We share pricing. We have the difficult conversations. We try to figure out how we're going to position ourselves in the market so we can all be successful. I think over the next five years, we all agree that there's, you know, there's going to be so much demand that it's not going to be as challenging. But that's kind of where we are right now. And so we're all seeing a lot of increased traffic, a lot of increased tours, but maybe not so much on the conversion rate. So why is 